Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, our next speaker is Bill Howell from OHSU, the CMOP institution at OHSU, and his talk will be on the e-science appliance, provisioning an inexpensive bottom-up bottom -up cyber infrastructure. is considering how to negotiate the VGA. It worked a moment ago, though, so I'm hoping it'll come up in a second. Sure did. Worked fine a moment ago. This doesn't seem to be. Kind of takes their care of everything for you, but when that fails, there's not much else you can do. Yeah, well, maybe I should. Anybody with a good Mac mojo want to? If you'd like to actually just transfer it over Jane's Dell, we might be able to do that. Why don't we work on that at the yep. same time, just in case? Here's this. Is this a thumb drive? Yep. What is this? Looks like it might be. That's a clicker? That's not going to be good. Okay. Right, one more try. <coughs> oh, wait. Here it goes, maybe. Here we go. Well, we'll see. All right. Great. So just your presence helped. That was. It knows its friends. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm going to be talking to you about some experiments that we've been doing in provisioning eScience software to the long tail of eScience. And this is some collaborative work with Roger Barger's team at Microsoft Research. So a little bit about CMOP. You see the logo there in the corner. This is one of uh, 17 NSF science and technology centers. Uh, this program crosses all domains. There's a couple in computer science. Ours is one of two that's in uh, oceanography. It's a partnership between uh, or Oregon Health and Science University, which is my employer, Oregon State University, and University of Washington. And it's a core and stuff funding for 10 years, starting from 2006, with a midterm exam after five years. And the mission statement there is related closely to oceanography, but what I'm interested in is the data. And there's two main sources of data. There's the observations, which are uh, quite small, uh, but there are near real-time requirements. And there's enormous heterogeneity in them, which is illustrated by this cartoon here. So there's fixed platforms in a particular point in space that uh, measures various characteristics of the ocean. And there's also autonomous underwater vehicles that swim around and planes that fly overhead and shoreside radar that uh, bounce radio waves off the surface of the water to measure velocities. And so there's a lot of heterogeneity and it's difficult to kind of manage. So that's the challenge there. The other source is rather larger. It's the model results, ocean circulation models, and they grow up to 25 to 40 terabytes. And they also have an unusual data type, which is this unstructured mesh that I'll comment on a, a little bit later. So about me, so I, I Although I work with these oceanographers and marine microbiologists, I am actually a computer scientist. Uh, and I'm sort of the only resident computer scientist there at CMOP, and I'm kind of the liaison for some of our... I'm not sure if you're picking me up through this microphone or that one, actually. I seem to hear myself less as I move away. Um, the liaison for some of our partners in computer science, we work with uh, Juliana Freire and Claudia Silva, University of Utah, and David Meyer, Portland State University, as well as Roger at Microsoft Research. And so I sort of consider this position that I have as a, as a computer science field study, if, if such a beast exists, where I'm sort of observing oceanographers and marine microbiologists in their natural habitat. And what I mean by natural habitat, I don't mean their offices. I mean places like this, which is the research vessel, the Wacoma. And so here's me on the Wacoma doing computer stuff, with exhibiting poor posture, I suppose. 
and here's me not just doing computer stuff, but also helping out handling equipment. So everybody has to kind of go through their uh, work phase while they're a resident there on the ship. So there's me doing mine. And I'll come in and come back to uh, what's actually going on there in a, in a little bit. All right, so this is the sort of background story slide that we've seen uh, a lot here, and this is the way I tell it. So I say the technology is turbocharging data acquisition, right? So the old model was to uh, pose, formulate a sci uh, scientific question and then design an experiment to gather data specifically to answer that one question, right? But the new model is that you don't have to do that. You can, you can decouple data acquisition from hypothesis formulation. And so we can just download the world en masse, put it all in a database, and then write our hypothesis against that. Okay. And this is why we're all here is that's what's going on. But, you know, the acquisition process, they're winning, right? The engineers that are designing how to gather data from the world are, are beating us. They're able to acquire data faster than we can analyze it. Okay. And so we see this happening in all fields, medicine with ubiquitous digital patient records and MRI scans and astronomy with the sky surveys rather than point targets and genetics. And so I left these last two lines blank because I was going to ask you guys what you think the transformative technologies are in oceanography or in marine biology. And I'll give you a hint that I've already mentioned one of them. So what sort of technologies are, are making acquisition outpace analysis? So remote sensing is, 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 is one. We, uh, we do a lot with satellites, but there's actually there's people that do a lot more satellites than we do, but that's, that's, a, that's a great answer. The one, I was, the one that I'm closely familiar with here is, uh, it's an animated GIF, I guess, so that's why it takes a little bit to come up. Or maybe I need to point it at that. Or maybe I shouldn't use this thing. Oh, there it goes, okay. So one is the circulation models as well, right? So instead of measuring individual points in, in, in the ocean, you're measuring at all points simultaneously and just generating terabytes at once. So some other examples of technologies. Uh, the Argo project, so cheap sensors is a, is a technology, right? They, they got the cost of these things down where you can take 3,000 of them and deploy them around the globe and just let them sit out there for 10 years, transmitting data out back up through satellite. So this is something that you know, couldn't be done 10 years ago. Uh, another one is, th this thing is from Imbari, the Monterey Bay Research Aquarium uh, Institute. Aquarium and Research Institute, and it's called the ESP, the Environmental Sample Processor. So this is a robot that you put out in the ocean. Water comes in one side, it does some wet lab chemistry for you, and DNA sequences come out the other. It's completely automated, the, the, the process of seeing what's in the water. That's, it's, it's pretty striking. But you can imagine that the bandwidth of the data coming out of this is a lot faster now that you don't have manual work to do in the lab. And along the same vein, there's this device called the FlowCam, which is also sits out there in situ. Uh, and watches the water go by and takes pictures of the particulate matter. And further, it runs some image recognition software or algorithms on it to identify the particles that are flying by and send you back a stream of images. So now instead of getting you know, a, a stream of floating point numbers, you're getting a stream of, of images. And so the bandwidth is much higher. And these guys, this, this company that builds this thing is actually sort of bragging about the problem that we're all here to try to solve. And they put on their website, you know, increase data collection exponentially in less time. You know, so we're, we're really good at filling up your hard disk with images, right? Never mind the fact that we don't necessarily know what to do with all those images. And, and also never mind the fact that they're sort of misusing the term exponentially, but. Okay, so, so, but, so my point there is that, is that you know, there's, we're sort of at war with these guys that know how to get, get information out of the world and we're losing, okay. So where is our target in particular? We, many of us have probably heard of this notion of the long tail of e-science and I just have a twist on it where I say it's the long fattening tail of e-science. There's big projects that are well-funded that uh, are trying to do things that have never been done before with enormous data sets, but there's lots of people that have much smaller data sets, but they have uh, no less significant data management challenges. Okay, and this argument with the long tail getting fatter is that, you know, your paper notebooks are becoming spreadsheets and your spreadsheets are becoming databases and megabytes are turning into terabytes and everybody sort of got the same problem. Okay, and so there's a little graphic explaining that. Uh, so what sort of software are we all building? Well, there's workflow systems, and we've heard about several of those here at this conference. But workflow systems, somebody that is a customer for workflow system not only wants to consume data using the workflow system, but a lot of times they want to publish their own data somehow. So you end up providing software to help them wrap their data as web services or load it into a database or something. So there's some extra dependencies there. Uh, then we've heard a lot about visualization as well, where as data set sizes increase, uh, visualization is no longer a luxury, it's a necessity because it's really the only way to map large quantitative data sets into intuition and understanding. Okay. And then more recently there's sort of the cloud services. So there's SDKs and APIs you need to uh, make these generic cloud services safe for science. And so we end up packaging all this stuff together 
into an e-science, what I'll call an e-science engine. And so I claim that that's sort of what the business that we're all in is to build these e-science engines and provision them out to people. And so what this talk is about is how to provision those or one way to provision those. So why is this hard or what, what's the big deal? Who cares what provision you You put a link on your website and they download it. Well, as we said, workflow systems or, or the general kernel of, of e-science has some dependencies and those dependencies have their own have their own dependencies. If you have some database work, perhaps you need to install SQL Server or PostgreSQL as well. Uh, for visualization tools, you need some sort of visualization library underneath that. And then those dependencies have their own dependencies where you need uh, OpenGL libraries for visualization. And eventually you need to say, you know, you must have a video card that has this, these specs on it. Okay. Uh, similar with the, on the database side, you might need to say that the IO subsystem needs to have these characteristics for us to, for us to work properly. And so navigating this, this dependency graph for your customers is, is the, your customers find this difficult, right? They don't have the skill sets necessarily required to configure a complex system such as an e-science uh, engine. Okay. So the question is, you know, where do you cut this dependency graph to divide the responsibility between those who provide the software and those who, are, who have to set up their environment to, to run it? And so you need to consider what your customer skill sets are and, you know, can they install RPMs? Can they compile code? Um, Really importantly, can they troubleshoot things? You know, when they when two components aren't talking to each other, do they know enough to sort of do the ping and s lookup trace route game, uh, like most of us are familiar, familiar with? Uh, permissions problems. You know, how many times do we spend, how many hours do we spend sort of troubleshooting file permissions in a, in a Unix environment or something? So they claim that in the long fat tail of e-science, the answer it's best to assume that the answer is no. You know, we all know some scientists that aren't going to be willing to do this kind of stuff. And then on the uh, it's not, just, it's not just saving them trouble, it's also saving you trouble though. Having to, when you develop your software, you don't necessarily want to have to support Windows environments and Mac environments and Linux environments of various distributions. It, you, you, you're, you want to do research, you don't necessarily want to provide tech support. Okay, so is there anything these busy scientists are willing to do? If I just gave a big list of things they're probably not willing to do. Okay. So we, we find that this is probably okay. They're, they're you know. Power and Ethernet work out well, and, and much beyond that is, is not well. So, so going through this work in our head, we said, well, well, how should we package everything up? And the answer is, you know, we're building engines, but people don't buy engines, they, they buy cars. And then I had to annotate that because, you know, in the last couple of months, they're not doing that either, but whatever. They, they once did, and maybe they will again in the future. Okay, so the idea is we want to sell them cars, not just sell them engines. And so what's the, carrying the metaphor further, what's a car? Well. It's the complete platform, right? It's the hardware, it's the software, operating system, everything all in one unit. And you give that to your customers. And so here's what I'm gonna give a couple examples and then I'll just sort of ask you to build your own appliances at the end and then wrap up. So one example that we have is this ocean appliance whose responsibilities include managing uh, shipboard computation. Okay, so it does some data acquisition, it ingests things into a local database, it handles telemetry back to shore from the research vessel, it does some visualization, and it's a kind of a local network uh, in, uh, app server. And the hardware is pretty modest, and the cost is pretty modest, just about 500 bucks. And it's kind of a LAMP stack with some uh, bunch of custom Python code to sort of do the actual science work. Okay. So we stick this thing out on uh, various vessels, one of which was the research vessel Barnes, and there in the green is the uh, lab part of the ship, and that's what this room is. It's very cramped, and we stick the machine up underneath here and strap it in, because everything needs to be strapped down on a ship, and uh, put a wireless router on it, and now we have a little local network that can all connect to the thing. And this is, you know, my laptop there looking at things. All right, so, so what do we do on the RV barns? What kind of science is going on? Well, we're sampling across gradients, and so this device is called a CTD, a conductivity temperature depth sensor and uh, it's going to be sunk into the water down and measure out a, uh, the water, uh, various characteristics of the water column. And then it's also gonna be able to take water samples at various depths through this tube here. So you can turn on the pump and it'll start pumping water from wherever it is. And this is kind of a primitive way. And so you grab the other end and you try to hang, you know, wrestle this thing into the point of the carboys and everybody gets very wet and it's sort of unpleasant. Uh, then the water in the carboys uh, gets pushed through these filters uh, and the filters are then frozen and brought back to the lab and they do uh, PCR on them to pull out some DNA. Okay. So here's a bigger ship. It's the same device, a CTD device with a, diff with a much more sophisticated sampling mechanism. Uh, these are called Niskin bottles and they, as they pass down through the water, they hold water. The water flows right through them. 
and it's basically a tube with two caps on the end connected by a rubber band. And from the ship, you can electronically release the caps so they snap shut and trap whatever water's there. And so with this way, you can get 12 different samples of water from various points of the, in the water column. Okay, and there's, that's what's going on there, and I'm helping to sort of make sure the thing doesn't swing back and knock anybody overboard, I guess, which somebody always has to do, so that was my turn. Okay. So here's a cartoon schematic of what's going on. It sinks down. You can trap some water here, trap some water here. We just heard about how turbidity is, a, is a noisy, so it's good that I'm able to sort of demonstrate some proof of this. This is, a, you know, this is measuring turbidity here, and you can see what a mess that data set is. Um, okay. So here are the same filters again. I thought I'd ask one more question. Is one of these came from near the bottom and one of these came from near the top. So which one do you think the dirty, the dirty one is? Top? Yeah, you're right. Okay, good job. So the top this has this, this uh, remnant of the plume from the Columbia River, right? So it's uh, lower to, or higher temperature. This is summertime. It's actually lower temperature, in the, lower than the ocean in the winter, higher in the summer. And uh, eat, whoop. And the salinity there gets low as well. And so all the muck and stuff from the Columbia River makes things a lot dirtier. And the bottom is very pristine. Okay. I keep wanting to think this thing is like wireless and ether, but you have to actually point it at the thing. Uh, so we also, I'm going to skip through some of these. We, you can also wire, we have multiple ships out there at once during cruises. And so we use these appliances to sort of manage the communication between them as well. Because we communicate with the shore through the swap network, which is ship-to-ship -ship wireless access protocol. It's basically throwing 802.11 over longer distances by, by using bigger antenna. But the bandwidth is kind of low, and it's kind of unavailable a lot, so it requires some kind of application-level code to make sure everything's uh, safe. So we can uh, use these appliances to, to relay things back to shore uh, nicely. So that's another purpose of this system-level appliance. Another job of this thing is to do some ev basic event detection. So there's this uh, red water, and I've been told not to call it red tide because red tide is harmful. This stuff is harmless. It's not a big deal. But you can see this really striking picture here from Ariel. It's, that's really beautiful. Um, and what, what happens in the data is you get this really spike of chlorophyll right below the surface. And the spatial variability of this thing is really uh, dynamic. This, these two buckets were taken basically in the same spot about a minute apart. And so a red thing, it just washed through, and you grab, grab some red in a bucket, then some clear water a few minutes later, and it was fine. And what's going on is there's this little guy, this Marionector rubra, that blooms in the summer in the Columbia River all the time. Okay, so detecting, this one's kind of visible, but the, uh, there's other events that are not visible except in the data. And so detecting these things and alerting somebody and sending emails out is one of the things the appliance does. Okay, and that's just sort of the zooming in on the picture. So... In a longer version of this talk, I can kind of click on these and talk in more detail about what the appliance is doing in various ways, but I'm just going to sort of just give the summary right now as it handles some ingested processing, it manages the database, it generates products and visualizations, and so on. Okay, so a second example is more recent, and now we're sort of broadening the scope. Instead of kind of a systems, you know, put it on the ship and nobody looks at it kind of appliance, we're now looking at sort of a user-facing appliance. So the idea here is to put CMOP in a box. Everything that you can do in CMOP servers put it into a machine and give that to people so that they can do it too. And this is where we have uh, the Trident Scientific Workflow Workbench that Roger Barger's group is developing as kind of the <laughs> workflow kernel. And attaching to that, we have a SQL Server database on there. We have this grid fields library uh, that I developed for, man for manipulating uh, simulation results. And uh, there's various things that come along with the Workbench. For example, they provide excellent interfaces to, to cloud services. Okay, so this is a little earlier on. We're still sort of figuring out exactly what we want to do with this thing, but we have the device and we have everything sort of installed. Um, I'm probably going to stride through this. I have a talk on Thursday about how to kind of integrate this grid field stuff in a workflow environment that I think is pretty interesting. Uh, so right now I'll just kind of comment that, you know, it turns out that coastlines are not pixelated, right? So you have to have these unstructured grids, these little tiny polygons to model the coastline well. And that causes problems all the way downstream. There's not really a lot of good set of algorithms for manipulating these. They're not very efficient when you do have algorithms. And it's all kind of a pain. And so what, we try, what I tried to do was develop an algebra for manipulating these things that makes it a little more convenient and helps uh, be a little more declarative as well. So there's a data independence, just the same way the relational algebra gives you a little bit of data independence from uh, uh, relations. This gives you data independence from grids. Okay. And you can optimize these things and commute operators around. and it's. Nice. So there's other appliances that I'm sure we've all heard of, right? In the commercial world, they're pretty popular. There's network-based appliances for doing spam filtering and filtering and so forth. 
these database appliances are definitely getting uh, a lot of attention. Uh, Vertica is Mike's, Michael Stonebreaker's company, and Atezza and Delta Allegro came a little before them, but have appliances. The Google search appliance you might have heard of. And so my question is, you know, why not why not e-science appliances? Why can't why not be in the business of each of us developing our own e-science appliance and passing them around amongst each other? Okay, I'm um, gonna skip that. There's data center in a box is kind of a cute example too, but we're not probably not talking about that. Um, so why do this? What are the benefits? Well, there's some obvious benefits. The deployment costs are, are lower, I claim, right? Because because everything always works on the development server, right? On the development box. And it's only when you move it off to the test server where we try to give it enough production that things start to go wrong. So why not just package up the development box and give that to customers and then build another one for your developers? And that's the model we've used, and it's really helped us control costs, uh, s uh, support costs. And so maintenance, same thing. We can always we can log in remotely and fix things if we need to because we have accounts on the, on the appliance machine. Unlike the situation if they download it themselves, we can't get access to it to fix things. And security on their end, they're okay with it because they leave this appliance outside their firewall, right? So we give them accounts on our machine but we're not allowed to have counts on their, on their resources, and so they like that a lot better as well. So there's some non-obvious benefits here too, though, is that if you get enough customers using these little appliances, you end up having a, kind of a free distributed test bed to try out more sophisticated types of features. So it's kind of a grassroots planet lab is how we, we hope to use it. And the only, the only example we really have right now is uh, the multi-ship coordination, which worked out pretty well. Um, also data distribution, you know, it's a lot easier to ship multi-terabyte data sets uh, preloaded on disk. I mean, it's hard to buy a computer now that doesn't have at least a terabyte of space on it, right? So you can fill that sucker up and give it to people, and they, they've, uh, you bootstrap them with a data set uh, uh, without them having to do any work. And that makes a lot of sense in our world where there's only a few models running. We're, we, we run a lot of the models for the Northwest, so many people are interested in our models. So there's a good way to give, give them the data. Um, and there's a sort of an argument of data localization, too. And, uh, I'm going to skip that, I think. So one question that might come up is, uh, you know, what about cloud? Everything's going to the cloud. Why are you talking about thick clients again? You know, this is, this is where we're going away from. And so I, I claim that they're actually complementary to, to cloud services, right? So they provide a local cache for the cloud, which I think is not too controversial. To imagine that might be useful. There's an integration point for public and private data. If there's data that you don't want to have out in the cloud, this is the place you put it because you own the box. You can control who has access to it. Um, it's an integration point for things that don't work on the cloud, such as MATLAB. We've heard some complaints about that. There's other sorts of wrappers and desktop applications that may, may have a home here that otherwise don't. And so there's also interesting widget questions. You know, how do you, how do you build architectures that span client to certain, you know, appliance to cloud? How best do we utilize this kind of dual architecture? Um, okay, and then I, I added this recently because uh, Darren Green's opening remarks said, recognizing the reality is cloud plus client, so I, so I liked that. So what about virtualization? Well, so, so we like virtualization, but think of virtual appliances, uh, in many cases, is just as good as a physical appliance. There's a you know, negligible unit cost. You don't actually have to build a machine and ship it to anybody. Um, these hypervisors are becoming pretty ubiquitous and they're pretty good. They uh, really do sort of appear to solve the platform heterogeneity problem so that you don't have to care what you know, operating system your customer runs. You just give them a virtual machine and they can run it. So the, the, the data distribution problem is still there, though, because um, downloading two terabytes over the internet is, is difficult, and, and Jim Gray has some reports on, on <coughs> shipping data physically rather than downloading it from a few years ago. Uh, also, these specialized hardware requirements still have a presence. Uh, so we, had, we needed a lot of serial ports for sensor interfaces on the ocean appliance, for example. Uh, 3D p uh, hardware acceleration or visualization people may need some hardware acceleration or specific video card requirements, and the database may need specific I.O. systems. Apologize, my phone is dying. All right, so that's that's my conclusion. So I just want to wrap up and say, look, you know, we're, these e-science engines that we're building. First of all, I claim we're building them anyway. Second, they're complex. You know, they're on par with sort of database systems or web servers, or, or very, you know, uh, require a lot of configuration. And that that configuration effort is out of scope or out of uh, the skill set of some of the customers that need this benefit or need these tools. So deploying a physical or virtual appliance can save time and money for both your customers and for you. Uh, and, and, you know, there are people out there besides the, your direct funding collaborators that need your software. And so this is a way to get it to them. And so I say consider building your own e-science appliance, put whatever software you want on it and pass them around and see if that works. And here's some acknowledgments 
from Microsoft Research and from UNICEF and NOAA. And I appreciate your attention. Also, I, so anybody that has a laptop open, click the link so that I can see the little bump on Google Analytics and I can go back and say that everybody, everybody clicked on the web page. So. Thank you. Okay, we do have time for a few questions. If anybody has some, please come up and use the microphones. So show of hands, like, uh, you might try this or you don't like the idea at all or what? So might, might try this. All right. <laughs> so I have a question for you, What's Bill. That? So once you've deployed the software, this, this makes for a great lowering the barrier to entry to get your stuff out into the field. How are you going to actually keep them synced up? Have you looked at technology because you know you're going to be pushing updates? Now you've got a big maintenance nightmare potentially if you don't to get that. Device. Right. So the, the, the way we handle that is uh, by leaving accounts that we can get onto. So now there's, so the, the appliance model sort of formally is kind of, uh, you know, there's no user serviceable components inside there. When, when something breaks, you just have to you replace the whole thing at once. Right. So we can log into the back end and actually fix things, which is something we can't do when you're, uh, you know, when you say downloaded a package and installed in your system. Right. I can't go get to your desktop and actually fix that. So that's kind of the way we handle maintenance. So it, so it doesn't it doesn't actually address the cost. Somebody still has to go in there and fix it, which I suppose is what you're commenting on. Well, co cost is fine, but I'm also thinking I can use sync networks or something like that. So the system's always syncing itself back up with some master pulling new DLLs and kind of keep configuring itself over time. Absolutely. So those any kind of frameworks that have there, this this obviously supports like everything's connected to the internet. We're not really that sophisticated yet, so we don't have the software. Or well, actually, the new one will be. <laughs> you guys are. <laughs> Our original Ocean Appliance wasn't that sophisticated, so we sort of didn't uh, didn't look at that. But and quickly, can you speak about virtualization? The role you think virtualization may play on this? Because you'd actually like to have an appliance that could be running even Mac OS or Linux or something. Absolutely. Like that. Right. And yeah. So, so we had that or one slide. So the yeah the uh, uh, virtual appliances and physical appliances, I think, are both. Uh, in many in many contexts, they're going to be indistinguishable. It's just as good to sort of pack. It. The, the main point is to get all that configuration headache out of the way, and so virtual appliances uh, solve that problem as well. Once you get it built, you can rip an image, put a link to that image out on your web, and now people can download and install it, run it anywhere. You don't have any, you don't have to worry about the platform at all. Any more questions? Let's thank our speaker one last time.